Hello, hello, Facebook Live. This is Pastor Thad, and I am here with my beautiful wife, Pastor Colleen. Hi. And we are here for Truth Alive. And uh, normally, Pastor Chad and I do this. Um, however, today, uh, he is up in the air. Uh, he and I were just with some, uh, some awesome men of God. We were down in Mexico. We we're at Playa del Carmen and, and Cozumel. And uh, hi, Debbie. And uh, so we recognized that he was going to be in the middle of flying back. And so uh, we decided to go ahead and do Truth Alive with, with my beautiful bride. And uh, yeah, praise God. I see my own wife logging in and apparently watching. So that's awesome. That's an impressive feat right there. And my mother-in-law who is on there as well. Praise God. And so anyways... Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna uh, just kind of chat a little bit, give some people time to kind of log in. So if you're logging in, make sure that you share this. Uh, make sure that, and then also, you know, we have one question that's come in, and so we are going to be addressing that here shortly. Uh, but I want to really encourage you to go ahead and get get some messages in there. Get a get a question in there. You can uh, do it right here on the feed if you are comfortable with everybody seeing the question that you're putting in. Um, but at the same time, if you have a question that maybe has a little bit of sensitivity, uh, you are more than welcome to go ahead and send it via messenger uh, to the uh, uh, to the Church Alive Facebook. Uh, and so we will go ahead and take a look at it. So I see my mom. Hi, mom. I see Bo. You are not my mom, but hi to you as well. And uh, so, so make sure that you are getting some questions in uh, so that we're not sitting here twiddling our thumbs and being totally bored. Um, and then also, like I said, make sure you share this. The more you share, the more people start to get in there, interact. And we've seen some really neat things where people who we don't each even know or just barely know peripherally, um, where they jump in and they start asking some really good questions. And so I want to encourage you to share this. And, uh, and hi, Tammy. We see you there. Good to have you. So praise God. So tonight it's going to be Pastor Colleen and I doing it. And we're just, we're not going to be focusing on relationships. Last time we did it together, um, we focused on relationships. We had a lot of fun with that. Um, but it isn't going to just be relationships. We're going to just kind of open it up uh, just to some questions just in general as well. Uh, so I want to encourage you to do that. Praise God. So we're going to go ahead and jump in here and we're going to do the first question. So, so I got a question. And this is a really good one. This is this is really fun. Pastor Chad, he saw it as well, and he and this is one of his favorite topics. So the question was asked. They gave a a, a, a a verse, a passage, and they wanted to understand what it means. So it's in Exodus chapter 32, verses 12 through 14. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to talk about it. Um, so now he put it. This is in King James version. Okay. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak? Now who's talking? Let me get this. Clarify. This is Moses talking to the Lord. Okay. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath. Now, this is again, this is Moses talking to God. Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou sworest by thine own self. And saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. So then the question is, can you help me understand what this passage means? Is this a literal translation or a mistake? Did the Lord really repent of evil, or is it just an old English phrasing? So what we're looking at... And it's a very, if you look at it at face value, it's a very interesting thing. It makes it, what it looks like is uh, Moses is saying, don't do this evil thing. Hey, Jonathan, brother, we love you. Don't do this evil thing, Lord, and please repent of this evil. And then it says the Lord repented of it. And so, um, so what does this all mean, right? Oh, okay. I didn't, didn't know if you wanted to, no, to, okay. to, to jump in there. Um, feel free to jump in whenever you want. Okay. 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 Um, so first, you want to look at the context. Whenever you are, are studying the Word of God, you need to understand the context. The context is the setting surrounding it. Um, the context could be the, uh, the uh, what is the book about? 
who is writing the book? What is the who is the, this writing to? If it's a letter, who is the letter being written to? What's the purpose of the writing? If it's the Psalms, recognizing it's a worship song, right? It's actually music. It's supposed to be meant to music, not to be read. It's supposed to be sung. Um, what is the meaning of it? And so in this case, the context is it's a historical document. Um, Exodus is literally writing about the history of, of the people. Moses wrote this. Um, so you also want to look at the context of what was happening within that story. So what we're looking at is this. Uh, Moses had given the Ten Commandments. He was going up to be with the Lord, and he was up there for a long time. And many of us are familiar with this story. He was up there for a long time, and Aaron, Aaron started getting Aaron, uh, started getting uh, uh, discouraged, and the people started getting worked up over things. Hey, Ann, and uh, and started getting a little bit of a of a um, uh, a mutiny going on with Moses being gone for so long. So they melted all this gold, and then they said, and they created idols, and they said, these are. The idols, these are the gods that, that rescued you out of the Egyptians, out of the hands of the Egyptians. And then they all started worshiping him. And then God had it. He just, he's like, you know what? These people are stubborn, they're stiff-necked, and I'm not going to tolerate it anymore. I'm going to just chop them down, and I'm going to wipe the slate clean. I'm going to start fresh. And, and he kept and he used phrases like to Moses, he's talking to Moses, he said, these are your people, your people. And so he would, he would chop them all. He was going to chop them all down. And then this was Moses' response to that. Now I will tell you, there's a couple of things that jump out at me with this. One of them is this is a good example how the King James is not necessarily the best version. I I understand that a lot of people are very adamant about King James only, um, but the reality is there are times where King James just doesn't cut it. Um, the King James, just as a simple example, talks about unicorns, right? And uh, uh, unicorns and how we understand the wording of unicorns is not the same thing as what was being written at that time. Um, so in this case, the wordage is difficult to work around it at times. So I'm going to read a couple of different versions of this. Um, right now, let me, let me just go ahead and stick with NIV. I also like the NAS, uh, but I'm going to read it out of NIV. And I'm going to go back in verse 11. It said, but, but Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Let me backtrack even more to verse 9. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them, that I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. O oh Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it is with evil intent that he brought them out? to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore uh, by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land, and I promise them, and I will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. So the wordage that was used in the King James is not what we would, we would realistically look at it today. When we think of repent, we always think of the act of sinning. What is sin? Sin is doing anything that's not God's way. That's all sin is. God defines a line that says, this is my characteristic, and anything outside of that is sin. Well, how then can God sin? Because that's literally within his nature. So when it talked in here about, in the King James, about repenting, first off, what, what he was saying was, don't let the Egyptians say this. So it wasn't saying that that's what he was doing, was that he was sinning. He was saying that don't let the Egyptians say this. If you do this, so what happened was the Egyptians, uh, they were delivered out of the Egyptians' hands. The Egyptians hated the Israelites. They hated, hated God. Hey, Brendan, I love you. Uh, hate it. And so what they were saying was if you wipe out, Moses was saying, if you wipe out all these people, that they're going to be able to point at this and say, you see, either God couldn't really deliver them or God um, didn't really want to. Right. And so he's saying, don't give them fuel for fire. Right. God, he's just he's just envisioning it. He's, and he's saying, God, don't let this happen. Right. It doesn't mean that God was sinning. It doesn't mean that uh, that he was doing anything wrong. And in fact, 
he was actually planning on carrying out a righteous judge, act of judgment, right? They had sinned, they turned their back on God, mm -hmm. and then all he was doing was he was saying, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to do wrath. I have the right, I have the right to exert justice on these people. And so then when it says in here in the King James where it was said that he repented, when we understand repentance, repentance is recognizing the need to change directions. And so, they, so King James used the word repent, but that's not really the best way of, uh, of using that word in modern day English. All it did meant was that he chose to do a different direction. Right now, does that mean God changed his mind? That isn't even necessarily right either, uh, because one of the fa fascinating things about this is this is a great example of the power of prayer. When you were praying, you were not convincing God of something to do something he wasn't going to do anyway. God chooses to act on our prayer. He chooses to listen to us and act as we implore him, as we turn to him. So that was what happened. He knew he wasn't going to just wipe them out. Mm -hmm. But what he did was, he said, he pointed this out and he said, I do not tolerate this. This is unacceptable what's been going on. And this is something that I'm, 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 I want to do. I'm, I'm, I'm so tired of this. And it caused Moses to begin to pray, to, to uh, prevail, to bring things to God, right? Um, and not only that, but it also gave a testimony as he went down to the people and said, hey, hey Ron, y'all screwed up, right? Like this, you just, you really messed up. You have any idea how close you were from getting completely wiped out and bringing a level of repentance out of the people. And so, hey, Martin, hey, uh, uh, brother, how you doing? And so, um, so that was what it was. It wasn't that that God sinned and that then he repented. It was that God was communicating the fact that they deserve judgment. Mm -hmm. And then it stirred something up within Moses to begin to pray for his people. And then God responded to that. And it's really easy to understand the confusion because um, in Numbers it talks about that God does not lie, neither does he repent. Mm -hmm. And so you're going, okay, it says he repented, but then it says he doesn't repent. So mm -hmm. what is the, but it's again, where it's kind of hard to understand with the language that they used. Mm -hmm. um, but it really was, God was, there was something that was in, within his right to do, mm -hmm. where he could have just flat out wiped him out. He, at any point, he really could wipe out the whole world and be like, you're sinners, mm -hmm. I'm wiping you out. But then there's also the other side, the flip side of it, that he has grace and he has mercy. And um, I think what you said is really appropriate. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I love you. I'm so glad <laughs> he's back home from Mexico. I missed this one. So that I'm, so I hope that that answers that question. Um, and you know what I love about about that whole idea again is, um, and there is another uh, another theologian that says that this was almost a type and shadow of of Jesus uh, mm -hmm. intervening be, between the right just the, the justice that God the Father can do on on a sinful people, His people, us. And then, and then Jesus being the intermediary, intermediary um, that that makes a way uh, where um, mercy, for us. Yeah. yeah, where mercy is shown, and and He holds back that hand of wrath because God could have He was fully just to to do that if He had chose to, mm -hmm. and He and He didn't, and it's because Moses interceded for that, and that's the beautiful thing about. And again, make sure you throw some questions. I don't see any questions on there, so if you got anything, please jump on there. Johnny and Sharice, I see you. We love you so much. Hi. Um, that's a powerful thing about prayer. Is um, pray, God does not need our prayers to act. He doesn't need our prayers. But he chooses to act on our prayers. Mm -hmm. And there's something really powerful about that. Um, because prayer, prayer is not for God. Again, he doesn't need it. Prayer is about us. Prayer is about something that we need. And it, it, it forces relationship, it forces interaction, it forces a level of dependence and acknowledgement of him. It is an act of faith that says, I need your help. Yes. You know, in this day and age, with the culture, the American culture that we live in, we live in a very naturalistic society where um, everything is practical, it's hands-on, it's what you can touch, it's what you can feel, and... Um, and um, Prayer doesn't fit very well in our in our day and age because prayer you are you are praying to the unseen God you are you are 
kindling a relationship to one that you cannot see. Mm -hmm. And you are showing reliance, which is so mm -hmm. counter to, uh, to today's day and age, where everything you need to be self-reliant, it's all about my rights. And, uh, and so it cultures this relationship uh, yeah. that we can have with him. Well, it teaches us patience too, because again, in our society, we're typically used to having um, everything right when we want it. If we want food, mm -hmm. we don't want to have to, we look in our fridge full of food and go, I don't know, I don't have anything to make because <laughs> it's not quick, quick, quick and not something I can pop in the microwave and be done with. Mm -hmm. And hey, Pastor Chad, good to see you. Love hey, you brother. too. Um, but he teaches us patience as well because we always, you know, we kind of talk about how um, in prayer, there's three answers typically is mm -hmm. yes, no, and wait. And sometimes we have to wait on God and his timing and it's uncomfortable for us, but it teaches us patience. It's always mm -hmm. really funny when we go through the fruits of the spirit, and we go, oh God, teach us love. Well, that's a good one to, you know, uh, teach us joy. Oh, bring all the happy things, you know, teach us peace. Then we get to teach us patience. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, I'm not sure I really want to mm -hmm. learn that one because to learn that one, you have to deal with the slow driver or you have to deal with you know, stuff that you, it makes you uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how it is with prayer where he takes us out of our comfort zones on prayer because sometimes he'll say, nope, just wait, just wait. It's not my time yet. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's, I see Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hi. Um, I love this. So I've been doing a little bit of a study on prayer and I don't know if I'm going to share all of this, what I was looking at, but, um, but there are times <coughs> where God intentionally chooses to not answer mm -hmm. to prayer yeah. he, he intentionally chooses and we don't like to think of that sometimes we want to think of god as as this father who is always with us which is true this god who always loves us which is true who who wants the very best for us which is true all these things are absolutely true but there's also situations where god intentionally will not respond to our prayers and we can position ourselves in such a place where god chooses to not listen to our prayers um one of them hey kylie hi um one of them talks about uh, about how you treat your spouse, about how your relationship with, in, in your marriage can actually position you in such a way where God will not listen to your prayers. Mm -hmm. And the idea of that's very difficult to think about that. I don't like the idea of God not listening to my prayers, but I but you think about the same thing as your kids, mm -hmm. right? When your kids, so I want I, I want the very best for my kids. I I love my kids. I want to actively love on my children. Mm -hmm. I want the very best for them. Um, but, uh, but you know, they talk about, uh, forgive if you don't, if you don't forgive, then, then God won't forgive you. Mm -hmm. And there's, there is a, there is a, a, uh, a principle there that says, again, imagine as you're a parent with your kids where, um, if you're, you're, this little one is mistreating this, this one, um, then, uh, there's a dynamic there that impacts my it hinders my ability uh to to do what it is that you're requesting i see nathan hey brother i see Anne. so okay so we do have another question that came up it says david had an undivided heart what are some practical ways we can have an undivided heart i see uh liana hi liana hi i don't know if i've met you before. oh yeah liana. Yes, hi, liana. Uh, i'm you're sorry nervous. I didn't look at the face. Catch you off guard. That's yeah. it. That's it. And I see. I see another Nathan. I see two Nathans. Hey, Nathan. <coughs> really quick before we move on to on the subject of prayer, um, talking about hindering your prayers. I just wanted to squeeze this in. Um, lots of times that you see in in um, the Bible, where like even in First Peter, it's talking to husbands and wives, and it mm -hmm. talks about how you should treat each other, and it literally says, um, so treat them this way so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Mm -hmm. And it talks about multiple times how communication with God gets disrupted when we have um, communication issues with our spouses or with other people around us because we start to harbor unforgiveness in our hearts. And unforgiveness is very powerful. It will stand in the way of your communication with God. And we don't we see it as a big thing, but we kind of sometimes don't see it as a big thing, being unforgiving, unforgiving, get that word out, all the way. Um, we go, oh, I'll deal with that later, because it's not, it's a big thing, but it's not, doesn't seem like a big sin or something in our lives. Um, but really, it is one of the biggest things where you start to grow that bitterness and that hardness in your heart, and every time that person's name come up, comes up, 
um, every time that that person, you know, crosses your path, there's that, that hurt and that thing that springs up that when you don't have forgiveness and you haven't let go of it and let God take care of it, then it's going to get in the way. Because mm -hmm. I remember there was one time and I, I've shared this a few times where, um, I came home from church. This was like 10 years ago or so. It was a while ago. I'm not all the way fixed in that area, but I'm doing a lot better, mostly because of this one and Jesus. Um, and I came home from church and something about this person had just struck me wrong. And I started ranting to Thad and it was not... Which was so outside of your character. <laughs> it was so... <laughs> I love you. It was so not godly. And... Thad listened to me. He was a good husband and he listened to me for just a little bit. And then he goes, have you prayed for her? And I stomped off into the other room and then promptly cried because I felt like an idiot because I knew he was right. And I had no argument against what he said. And it really comes down to that is if you can't pray over that person and really release that unforgiveness to the Lord, there's going to be a block in your communication with God because he's going to, you don't forgive them. I can't forgive you. It's literally in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to squeeze that in about prayer before we moved on. And then I'm sorry, what was the question that we had? Okay. So it says <coughs> David had an undivided heart. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some practical ways we can have an undivided heart? <clears throat> Something that, um, hmm. that it's really easy to do. And I, and I say this, uh, with about myself, and I don't think that I'm alone with this one, is that it's really easy to put just about any godly character in the Bible onto such a high pedestal that they become unrelatable, mm. right? Yeah. Um, where he, he, people, you know, David is a great example. The Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart, right? Mm -hmm. um, we look at Moses and, and it said that he was the most humble man who'd ever lived, right? Um, you have some of these people who are just so amazing, and it's very easy to put them at a pedestal, and they're not relatable. And David was very relatable, because if you look at some of the mistakes that David made, David made some some doozies, right? He did some really messed up stuff. He intentionally put, he, he, he uh, washed a woman bathing, and he said, I want her. And so he intentionally found out who her husband was, and put him on the front line so that he could be killed, just so that he yeah. could marry her. That's jacked up. That's really messed up. He did a lot of really messed up stuff. Um, but when you talk about where God, where David was a, uh, had an undivided heart or he was a man after God's own heart, what he was talking about was one thing was very clear. God had a, David had a certain priority that was in place, and that was he genuinely prioritized his relationship with God and his trust in God over all things. Didn't mean that his flesh would get in the way. He didn't make boneheaded mistakes. You know, guys, I will tell you what, guys deal with with fleshly issues in a, in a ridiculous level. It's just the truth of it. Um, it was a woman that, that took down David. It was um, women that nailed the wisest man on earth, his son, Solomon, right? And had all these women, all these concubines. Bad idea, right? Mm -hmm. um, so he, still, he was still very sinful, but his undivided heart was that it was so focused on the Lord that it produced a very, very repentant heart. Um, he was very willing and open to saying, I screwed up. Mm -hmm. And you know what's amazing is we read the story about when he was, uh, the Ark of the Covenant had come into the city and that he just took off all his clothes. And this was the king, right? Not mm -hmm. just any king. He was a king's king. He had killed tens of thousands military-wise. He was, he was adored. And then he just, and whether it was with a loincloth loin or just straight up naked, Different people vary, but he was so unhindered in his worship that he just danced like crazy with all yeah. of his might. He didn't care what anybody else thought. Can you imagine that person in a church today, in the modern American church, some, someone dancing with such unhinderedness and joy um, in the middle of worship? We get uncomfortable when things are too demonstrative. And uh, um, and so the idea of being able to dance like that is is incredible. And that's something that makes me feel very uncomfortable, my nature, my flesh, because I'm not a demonstrative person when it comes to the Lord. I'm very devoted. Um, I love God with all my heart, 
right? I study his word. I strive very hard to live in godly wisdom, but I'm not a very demonstrative person. I, I'm not one yeah. that just gets super emotional, you know, like you, you are very comfortable yeah, with that, definitely. right? Yeah. And so, um, so the idea, so I think that's a big part of, of David is that um, he truly did not care what anybody else thought he was going to follow the Lord even when he was a young person and everybody else was afraid of going after Goliath. He just had such a trust in, in <clears throat> God that he didn't even care what anybody else thought. Mm -hmm. It was just all about him. Yeah. Well, in, in Psalm 86, I actually just read this the other day. And so it was funny that that question came up. Psalm 86, 11, it says, teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. And it goes on, like many of the Psalms do, of I will praise you, O Lord, and, and for you are great and do marvelous deeds. Um, he literally asks for an undivided heart. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy to have a divided heart and kind of push it off and say it's not a big deal mm -hmm. because we have a lot of things that take up our time. And there's even a part, um, and I think it's in 1 Corinthians, where uh, he's talking about... Um, the, the more that you are away from other people, like you're not married or you don't have kids, the more undivided attention you can put on God. And it's not that it's bad to get married or have kids, obviously. Um, we're, we're in that. Good to know. Yay! <laughs> um, but it's, it has to do with your heart posture towards mm -hmm. God of always having your attention on Him. I like to talk about, you know, the verse that says, pray without ceasing. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of circling back to prayer again. Um, pray without ceasing is... It's not that you are literally with your mouth all day long praying. Mm -hmm. It's like having a phone line open mm -hmm. to God where if you were driving around at work or something and you just literally had your phone on speakerphone and mm -hmm. I had my phone on speakerphone and so we were just always in constant contact with mm -hmm. each other. So if all of a sudden something came on his heart, then I immediately know because he's talking to me about it. Mm -hmm. And if I have something on my heart, it's the same where he immediately knows because I'm talking to him about it. And that's what pray without ceasing means. That's that undivided heart. And I think that the, where David did go wrong a couple times um, was obviously like with Bathsheba. I think that he went and he put that phone on mute and he got his attention over on mm -hmm. something else. And our undivided heart comes with undivided attention to where, where our focus is is um, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. And his heart would stray off to these other things, but then get right back in line when God said, oh, hey, wait, what's going mm -hmm. on? And so that undivided heart comes with undivided attention. And I see a couple of people. I see uh, Andy that jumped on there. Brother, I love you. We miss you. I see Michelle. And I see Katrina. Ooh. Hi, guys. Yes. Um, so along with your, what you were talking about that, I, <coughs> I love, I, think we, I might have talked briefly about this before, uh, and maybe not. I know that... You, you're talking about praying unceasing and an undivided heart. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've told people before where at times at work, <clears throat> I worked here at home. I had a, I have a little office up in our, in our master bedroom, a little desk and everything. And I would wake up in the morning and I would pop up my laptop and I would work all day there. And in the meantime, Colleen homeschools. She's, she's a stay-at-home mom and she's got all the kids here and she does the, does the cleaning and the cooking and the, and the you know destroying our children and all the different stuff that goes along with that. <laughs> And, uh, but there were times, you know, she'll get on Facebook or be on her phone or whatnot. And, but she knows that when I'm working, I need to be focused. I've got this very tunnel vision. I've got emails and phone calls and all the stuff that will go on. And there were times, many times, mm -hmm. where you would open the door quietly and I'd be sitting there working and you'd close the door. And I remember times where you wouldn't even look at me. You would literally come in and they just kind of sit down in the bed. And just your your you got your cup of coffee, right? And you and and your and your phone and you're scrolling through and you're reading, your who knows what you're doing. It'd be there for 10, 15, 20 minutes and then leave. Not say a single word. Just mm -hmm. and it was because you just wanted to be with me, right? And um and that's what that prayer and ceasing is, is to have a level of fellowship, and that's what prayer does as well. Mm -hmm. Prayer and it, it, it forces you to, to search for that relationship, that, yes. that connectivity that is always happening. And that is very much, I agree with what, what you're saying, is where David was, having an undivided 
heart, where there's a nonstop, just an interaction. It doesn't always have to be verbally praying to God. It's just a being in his presence. You know, I just got back from Mexico and I was telling her all about um, this resort that we were in. It was so cool because there's all this jungle, right? This awesome jungle stuff. And then these boardwalks and these boardwalks would go around and they'd be going up and it was just a beautiful place. Yeah. And um, there were, <coughs> I would be walking and, and I went with a men's retreat and I love these men of God, but I miss my wife. And there were times where I, I could be walking and just to actually have you with me. And so when I would call her, I would oftentimes intentionally call and I would be walking on the boardwalk, just having you on the phone with me. And, and it was just wanting your presence. That's what prayer does. That's what the, an undivided heart looks like mm -hmm. is to just to have to strive for a nonstop connectivity um, with God and to be wanting with him at that time. Yes. So praise God. Okay. We had another question come in from Nathan. Uh, it says, I have a question. The Bible talks about the very elect will be deceived. My question is how to prepare for that so you're not deceived. And can you go more in depth with what the Bible is talking about? So I'm going to, uh, I don't want to go too far into this. One thing, we, whenever we talk about elect, um, we did discuss this a little bit last week, discussing um, uh, Arminianism and Calvinism. Calvinism. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to go into, into full depth with this, but, but Calvinists believe that um, pure Calvinism, tulip Cal Calvinism, the five points of tulip, believe that, uh, that we do not have the ability to, on our own, to, to accept Christ. That God elects specific people that he chooses out of his own will to have the ability by the Holy Spirit to receive Christ. So that, that we, are, we are total depravity. We are completely depraved. We don't even have the ability through free will to be able to accept Christ. He elects us. So there are several, several different times where the Bible talks about the elect, the elect, the elect. Um, Arminian thought, and this is mostly where I come from, is that he elects through foreknowledge. And the Bible talks about that several different places as well. Where he already he didn't say, you are going to accept me. You are not. Mm -hmm. He didn't do that. He said everybody has the ability to do it, but he discusses the elect as, as those he already foreknows. He already knows who is going to choose him, who is going to accept him. So through foreknowledge, these are the elect, if that makes sense. Um, so and, and, and the word of God actually uses that language, using foreknowledge. Um, so I wanted to clarify on that one. But then he said that the very elect will be deceived. How do we prepare for that so that you're not deceived? And then my boy Andy, who jumped in there, uh, we were his youth pastor back in a long time ago. I won't oh, say the year. It was, it was back there, buddy. And uh, I love it. He said, you can prepare yourself so, so you're not deceived. It's a barrier to self scripture. Um, read the Bible for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I wholeheartedly agree. Yes. Um, so here's the thing. There's not enough just to read. And I really mean this. Um, at one point, we're going to go through what's called hermeneutics, how to interpret the Bible. Mm -hmm. And again, this is something I may have discussed before. But when you approach the Bible, you need to make sure that you're approaching it the right way. Mm -hmm. So there are different, there's two different forms of interpretation. One of them is called eisegesis. The other one is called exegesis. These are Latin terms, and it has to do with how you interpret, really how you interpret anything. You can interpret a, just a piece of fiction, a Mark Twain book. You can interpret just about anything if you tell me something, right? We're having a conversation. You're telling me a story, how I interpret uh, what you're saying. So um, eisegesis, and it's not spelled like J-E-S-U-S. -S, it's, it's a totally different thing than that. Eisegesis or eisegetical interpretation has to do with reading into what is being said or reading into what the Word of God is saying. Kind of so, like when men and women talk and, and I say, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And I might actually be fine, but he might read into it, uh-oh, she said she's fine. What does that right. actually mean? <laughs> but I actually meant, no, I'm really fine. Mm -hmm. Or the exegetical. Yeah. So I said Jesus is reading into it. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of ways that you can take the Bible and you can read into it. You can read into it a views that you want it to say. You can read into it views that you've always been taught this is how it's supposed to say. You can read into it um, 
uh, several different things, different ways, and we're going to explore that further on in our in our Truth Alive. Then there's exegesis or exegetical interpretation, and what that means is you're drawing out the truth of what the Word of God is actually trying to communicate. Um, and so there's different ways of doing that. There's looking at the context, and it can be very difficult to read the Bible with an exegetical interpretation mm -hmm. because it's very difficult to try and pull 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 out the things that I wanted to say, right? Um, and and the things that have already been been taught. I I've had I've had wonderful teachers that have poured into me, uh, but I have to be able to go to the Word of God and push some of that stuff aside. And focus on what is the Bible actually trying to communicate. Uh, and so that, I think, is a really big key to being, avoid, being able to keep from being deceived. Because it's easy to get deceived if you are looking for the Bible to validate or justify what you were already wanting it to say. Um, I will give you an example, and that is the case of homosexuality. So this is a very hot topic today. Um, there's a lot of churches that are for homosexuality. There are some that will say that uh, that some people are naturally or born homosexual. There are other people who say you have to uh, that uh, God is totally okay with it, and they'll take the scriptures. And so um, I really wanted to know what God actually says regarding homosexuality. And I will tell you that my heart, my natural inclination, my desire is that it's okay. I'm just being honest with you. Uh, my natural inclination is I, want, I love the idea everybody. of everybody should okay. be able to love whoever it is they want. That's a fantastic view. That's a fantastic heart towards that. But I didn't want to just go down that path. I wanted to know what does the Bible actually say about it. And so I read and I studied and I look at some Greek and Hebrew and I look at commentaries and I really tried to, I wanted to know, God, tell me the truth. And ultimately... The truth is, God is not for homosexuality. He didn't design it. He de designed relationships to be between a man and a woman. And there are very, very good reasons for that. There is some godly wisdom behind that. Mm -hmm. And so I had, to, I had to put aside what I wanted it to say so that I can get to what God was really saying. And when I began to do that, I began to understand why it was that he did this mm -hmm. and so um so and i and again i don't i don't want to be tonight all about this topic but the reality is if you uh you want it to say you can make the word of god say whatever it is you oh. want it to say you can manipulate mm -hmm. it you can twist it you can you can do that um but it's not healthy and so do you want to well i know that earlier we talked about um when we're talking about isogetical interpretation and exegetical mm -hmm. And that happened earlier when we were talking about the Lord repenting on, you know, this verse says that mm -hmm. the Lord repented and you had to actually go into like the Greek and the Hebrew or, you know, go back into, well, yeah, not the Greek and the Hebrew, sorry, uh, Pastor Chad, um, but go back and look at the original intent and what the original meaning was. And that was not a great interpretation in the English language, mm -hmm. but you go back and look at the actual meaning of it and you can draw out what the original intent was. So, so here, here's one of my favorite examples. Um, we, I bet many of us have, have heard this before. In Revelation chapter 320, it says, G, uh, said, Jesus is talking and he said, uh, said here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And how we usually use this, and I have used this for this purpose, is we use this to introduce people to Jesus. Where you are a sinner, you are, you are living in sin, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, and he is standing at the door of your heart, and he's knocking, and he says, I want to be with you, and if you come in, I will eat with you and you with me. It's a fantastic verse for, for, for a salvation message. Yes. However, that's not what it was intentionally written for. If you actually look at the context of it, he is writing to a church. He's writing to the church of Laodicea where he just said, you're, you're milk toast, you're, you're blah, you're nothing, you're, you're, you're not doing anything. And he, said, and he said, for those of whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. He's talking to Christians, he's talking to church people, and, and, and they, were, they lost their fire. And he says, here, now, here I am, I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice. So yes, you could use that verse, and you can use it effectively to lead someone to Jesus. However, 
you are not using it the right way. you're taking it out of context and manipulating it, twisting it. just because it produces fruit doesn't mean it's the right way of doing it. so how do you keep yourself from being deceived? you you approach the word of god, you stay diligent and read the word of god. you read the bible and then you make sure that you you do it with an honest heart to say, god please help me do my very, very best to not try and make this say what i want it to say. yeah that's how you do it. and andy, you were dead on. well, and i know that also um uh, something that I had heard, and I don't know exactly how much truth there is to this, but something that I had heard that I thought was fascinating was um, when a banker, how they tell counterfeit is somebody asked them one time, how do you tell what is counterfeit and what is not? Mm -hmm. Well, my thought would be personally to study and look at all the counterfeit ones and be able to recognize them as they come across and be like, oh, that would catch my eye, red flag right there. And the person said, uh, no, actually you study the original, mm -hmm. the actual money, so that when something fake comes across your way, that immediately there are red flags that you go, oh, that's not the truth. Mm -hmm. That's not the truth. That's not real money there. And so it's kind of like what Andy said is dig into scripture. Know the scripture so well for yourself. Don't just go to church and get it fed to you. I mean, that's good too. Go to church, get it fed to you. Mm -hmm. But um, don't just do that. Because if you focus so much on that one meal a week or those two meals a week, you're not feeding yourself continuously and you will end up easily being deceived mm -hmm. because somebody will come in and say something and you don't know the truth and the word for yourself. And all of a sudden, oh, well, that looks appealing. That sounds more like what I want to hear. I'm going to hang on to that. Mm -hmm. Instead, um, you look at when Satan came up against Jesus when he was fasting out in the wilderness and he came to him and, and he even quoted scripture to him that if you throw yourself off this mountain, that angels will carry you and you'll be fine and, you know, do this thing. And Jesus, every time, responded with scripture because he knew mm -hmm. the truth. He knew the counterfeit of Satan was twisting it to try to make it work for him. Mm -hmm. And instead of responding with, oh, well, that's kind of interesting. He knew the truth and mm -hmm. he responded with it. And that's something actually that I love about um, some of the people that we've surrounded ourselves with at Church Alive that God has brought into our lives that I'm just so thankful for. Um, where there will be times where you go, hey, pray for me. I need help, you know, with this. And they immediately speak the word of God, truth. They don't just go, oh, honey, okay, I'll pray for you. See you later. They immediately, right there, pray over you, speak the truth into you. Mm -hmm. And it's because it's built up in your heart. And it's like that verse says, hide the word of God, or, or thy word have I hidden. I'm going to quote King James because <clears throat> that's what I grew up on and that's what I learned. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And that's where... That's how it works, is you study and you know the real truth mm -hmm. so well that when the counterfeit comes across your way, mm -hmm. you will not be deceived. Now, I love the fact that Pastor Chad jumped in here. <coughs> I'm going to read out what he said, because he, like I said, he's getting ready to fly home from Mexico. He says, I'm going to touch in on this real quick before I board the plane. I was wondering at what point, brother, when you were going to jump in here. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so he put, Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, and he has yes. promised to lead us into all truth. He is a person, and when we walk closely with him, then we will know, that is, to understand all things. He is a person, and you will receive checks in your spirit, as well as disagreeing statements from others against your study. When you have a personal, connected relationship with Holy Spirit, he is yes. critical to avoiding deception. Amen. Yes. 100% agree. Oh, yes. And, uh, and also, regarding the Word of God, um, one of my favorite verses, this is in, in Acts chapter 17, and I love this. So Paul is, is journeying, whatever, and then in verse um, 11, he's preaching, and he said, Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians. Why? It says, For they received the message with great eagerness, and then they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul was saying was true. And um, one of the things that we're in very in danger of, especially, again, here in America, is to follow a charismatic leader. Mm -hmm. You get people that have, they're, they're people movers, right? There's a, there's, some people have a gravitas, a weight to their character, and you just want to gravitate to them, mm -hmm. right? Now, we have that kind of person in Pastor Trey. He is, he is no doubt, he is a dynamic mm -hmm. personality. Um, but what, what it said is the Brians were, weren't going to accept just 
the charisma. Because it said they were eager to receive it, but they would make sure they would go back and they would align everything with what the actual scripture does. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you this, and, and Pastor Trey, he loves the Word. He really does. He studies it, and then he surrounds himself with people who love the Word, and, and we, are, we are able to interact. It's amazing. Yeah. We're able to agree and disagree in a lot of things. Pastor Chad, Pastor Trey, and I will, will get around, and we'll, we'll hit all kinds of different stuff, and we'll compare it to what the Word says, right? Mm -hmm. He loves the Word, and that's a really great thing. Um, but don't ever follow, ever, ever follow a man who tells you that you don't need to follow up with scripture, or if he gets offended if you follow up with scripture. You know, the, the Jehovah's Witness, they actually believe very much so that you cannot understand the Word of God without the Watchtower. The Watchtower is the organization that runs Jehovah's Witness. They come out with uh, those little pamphlets, Alive and the Watchtower. And what they will say is they will base all their Bible studies off of those teachings, and they say you can't understand it without this teaching rebel or revelation. Mm -hmm. That is a very, very dangerous thing to try and do. Everything that you hear taught to you, you need to go and make sure that it aligns with the Word of God. Because otherwise, you're not putting faith in God, you're putting faith in a man. You're putting yeah. faith in, in an individual, and that is giving that person way too much power. Hi, Wendy, by the way. Good to see you. Okay. So, do we want to move on? Yes. Okay, praise God. So, we got Jonathan jumped in here. And it's a question, as somebody who <coughs> listens to Todd White, Damon Thompson, Dan Moeller, and others, it's surprising to me how many people actively protest them, calling them heretics or false shepherds. They claim it's their duty to do this. You know what they're against, but not what they're for. What motivates this? I haven't read a scripture that says to picket preachers we disagree with. So there's a couple of different things. I have a couple of different views on this. Um, there are, without a doubt... You know, I, I, I had the joy of going to a, a Bible college where I had some tremendous men of God who were able to pour in pour into my life. Some of them just through straight up relationships, some of them through through the classes. And um, but they were, one of the things is they did not agree on everything. And listen, that's okay. It's really, really okay if you don't agree with every single doctrine that someone else believes. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of power in having grace for someone else to do that and not have to make an argument over it, not yeah. have to fight over it. There are certain things that that are absolute black and white. Jesus is Lord. He is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. He died for my sins. I need a Savior. These are key things, right? Mm -hmm. There, But when you start to get to some of the other peripheral things, um, don't let yourself get worked up over it. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so, I personally believe that the primary reason why some people call out false, and it's not unscriptural to call out false prophets. Paul yeah. was very, very adamant about it. Um, Paul generated 90% of what we would consider to be modern doctrine today, well, his writings. Mm -hmm. and, and what's amazing about that is he based all of that off of the Old Testament, which is incredible. Um, but so much of our doctrine today is based off of what his writings are. And, and he would call out false teachers. He would call them up by name sometimes. He would call them up by practice. He would say, these people are teaching this and you need to get away from them. These people are, are inside of your body and they're messing things up. You need, to, you need to cast them out. He would call this stuff out. So there is a place for that. There really is. But, that's, but that was where he would deal with the very the, 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 the black and white things, the very specific things. Because also... Someone was saying, hey, hey, Paul, this, these people over here are preaching Jesus. And they said, hey, so long as they're preaching the gospel, I don't care. So he recognized there was a line that you need to recognize that say, this is apostasy and this is stuff that is absolutely destroying and tearing down uh, the kingdom of God and leading people astray. And then these are things that are like, you know what, Jesus is still being preached. You need to let him be. And so I think that's one, some people blur that line. If it isn't what I agree and how I interpret the Bible, then it's wrong. And if it's wrong, then you're wrong and you need to stop. And that's all people know how to do. Some people are that way. And it's just a fleshliness. And I think it's an, an, it's a, it comes out of um, a lot of insecurities mm -hmm. in, in their life. Yeah. I agree. I actually was just on Facebook. There's a lady that I follow on there that um, she had been talking with a friend of hers and felt that she had a revelation of that yoga was wrong. Now I am of the mind 
set of the religious aspect of it obviously is wrong because you're literally worshiping another god but the stretches that yoga provides are not like to me i have no conviction over them i have no conviction that this is a sin or this is something wrong or will draw me away from god if i'm practicing the religious part of it obviously yes but the stretching of it, there's stretches that we do that are, I've stretched and somebody has said, oh, you're doing downward dog. And I'm mm -hmm. like, what is downward dog? Because <laughs> I don't do yoga. And um, that was the concern for me was that when you have a conviction about something, then sometimes you try to apply that to other people. And that's not how it's meant to happen. It's. When God convicts you of something, you operate out of that <laughs> conviction. If you are, um, do, you, do you understand what I'm mm -hmm. trying to say there? Okay. So, um, but don't expect other people to live according to your convictions. Even, we don't do that with people in the world that don't know Christ. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't go to them and go, hey, you're supposed to um, love your wife as Christ loves the church. They're going to be like, I have no clue what you're saying because that doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know anything about Christ. And so it's the same in our Christian culture is we take things and try to apply it to somebody else that maybe isn't biblically based. Like for this one with the yoga, I didn't feel like there was a biblical basis to um, being having it as a doctrine versus having it as a personal conviction. So um, that one was a little bit like, again, not on the religious parts of it. Don't worship another God, obviously. But do you get what I'm trying to say? I do. That? Okay. Absolutely. I'm trying to say it and I'm not sure if I'm saying it right. So. And I also want to, I think this is part of it as well in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. conform no longer to the patterns of this world, yes. but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I think that we live in a very negative society. Mm -hmm. I stopped watching the news a long time ago because mm -hmm. it's so negative focused. And I think that, um, that there is a very natural inclination to go towards the negative. Mm -hmm. If someone says something nice to us, we remember it. If someone some says something negative to us, we never forget it, right? Yeah. Um, we allow that to to pick at our heart and pry at our brain and get us all twisted up inside. Yeah. Um, we, we, gen we go towards, if you pull up the, the internet and you go on the, read the news, uh, the news today, almost everything is negative. It's just negative, 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 negative. And I think that we've allowed an awful lot of that into the church today. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is yes. my strength. Yes. And I think that there are times where there's a lot of joy that's missing. Mm -hmm. and, and it's because we've conformed as the church, we've conformed um, to to the world. Uh, how many how many of us have been to church services where you go, this is dead, this is dry, this is mm -hmm. the word is being being taught. There's <clears throat> conviction which has its place, but Jesus was clearly a joyful individual. How do we know this? Because kids were coming in droves to go see him. Yes. Kids aren't drawn towards negative people, <laughs> right? So true. And so so he. He was a joyful, full of life individual. You can do that yes. and you can be convicting when that time has come. And so I think that uh, that an awful lot of Christians don't know what it is to actually have the joy of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And if you have the joy of the Lord, then you stop focusing on all these other people's negative stuff. And uh, and I'm not saying you don't call it out when it's when it needs to be called out. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a big motivation. And I really do believe that a lot of it is also based off of insecurities. The pride and fear that's all rolled up inside of us, and we don't know how to do, deal with it. So how do we deal with it? We criticize and pick at other people. It's so easy to be critical of other people. It's easy to be critical of other people because when we're critical of other people, we don't have to be critical of ourselves. Oh, we don't have to think term. about this, the, the, the garbage that's yeah. going on inside of us because yeah. the lime is on here, the lime is going to be on you. And especially if you're a pastor, if you're a doctor, if you have a, if you're a theologian, you've got all this all the credentials, mm -hmm. then it's so much easier to just focus on other people's problems mm -hmm. and that way you don't have to look at your own. It's that whole splinter and log thing where my log is sticking out of my eye and I'm walking around smacking people with it and trying to get the splinter out of yours and I can't even see. Mm -hmm. um, and it, like he said, it's important to call out if there's false doctrine being preached or something that is definitely against the scripture, then that should be granted a lot of calling out has been done on Facebook or on social media mm -hmm. when in actuality it's way better to go approach that person one-on-one -on -one 
and sit down and actually have a conversation. Because when you try to have a conversation via social media, usually uh, there's pride attached. Mm -hmm. And Because I've been in this place before where I've defended something, and maybe even rightly so. Like, I defended it, and it was a good thing to defend. But my pride got attached to mm -hmm. that I was going to win the argument. And it's not about winning an argument. It's about having a dialogue mm -hmm. and discussing something so that there you can come to a place where you understand the other person. And if you're actually trying to convince somebody, if I'm trying to convince somebody to get saved, that Jesus, they need Jesus, I'm not going to hammer them over the head unless really God tells me that that is necessary in the moment. But normally I'm not going to hammer them over the head and try to drive a point home because it even talks about it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Mm -hmm. And we're a little bit strained from the, what he was talking about with the, um, with the uh, people being called false prophets yeah. and such. Watch for, oh, hi, Kylie, good to see you. Um, I love you, I miss you. Ah, oh, and congratulations. Yay, <laughs> I'm so excited for you. Um, straight off topic there, grab it. No, um, I, if there's something wrong, call it out, preferably in person, but also, um, it's really important to have grace for other people that we don't all have it all figured out. Mm -hmm. I am going to get to heaven and I'm going to go, oh, well, that point was off, but I got the right points right. Like Jesus is Lord and he's the only one who saves us from our sins. And he died on the cross and rose again so I could have salvation and freedom and that he is my Lord. All of that stuff is like the concrete stuff that cannot be moved. But I'm going to get to heaven and I'm going to be right next to my Baptist friends mm -hmm. who maybe don't believe in raising their hands during worship or don't believe in speaking in tongues. And they're going to be right there alongside of me. Oh, yeah. And some people would call out Baptist preachers and say, oh, they're false prophets because they don't <clears throat> preach the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Or um, with these guys, like maybe they preach something that's it's not bad different. It's just that they've had a different revelation of Jesus in their own personal mm -hmm. life. And um, they're sharing that with people. And again, like with the yoga person, I didn't, I wasn't disgruntled with her or mad at her. It was just like, well, that's not my conviction. So, you know, I'm going to dialogue with you on here because it was an open dialogue communication kind of style. And um, I didn't feel like I was challenged, like I needed to win an argument kind of thing. But it was a good discussion about... Um, what we felt on the topic and it's the same kind of thing with these guys if somebody calls them as a false prophet mm -hmm. private message them get together with them and talk with them about what they think about it and um because you're not going to really convince somebody usually over social media mm -hmm. and, it, and, and being that critical um, <laughs> shows a lack of humility as well mm -hmm. yeah. you know one thing i very firmly believe is that when the day the body says when you're when you're absent from the body you're present with the lord so when i'm absent with this body i'm going to be present with the lord i think i'm going to be going to gain a new revelation about what the word of god really says and i'm almost i'm 99.99 percent .99 certain i'm going to look at a couple things and go Ooh, Ooh, I got yeah. that one wrong. Yeah. Like I don't. Nobody has the monopoly on the perfect interpretation of Scripture. Nobody does. So there needs to be a level of humility, as you said. Yeah. You're talking. If you're being critical and critical and critical and critical, you're being critical of brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes. And you need to check your spirit a little bit when you when you do that. Um, it's that same spirit that oftentimes keeps people from being a true part of the church mm -hmm. as well. The church was God's idea. That was His idea, and He didn't do it just for His sake. He did it because uh, it's a family. And, and if you were raised, obviously, you know, if you were raised with parents and you were raised with brothers and sisters, you get at each other, you grade each other, you, there's criticism, there's all these different things. There's lots of this abrasion that's going on, mm -hmm. but you push through that. You learn how to deal with that. That's what makes a great yeah. marriage is there's lots of this stuff that's going on, mm -hmm. and you learn how to deal with different, uh, disagreements, and you can still do it in a form of love. Mm -hmm. You can still love someone and not agree with everything that they say, not agree with everything that they do. Yeah. Um, sometimes they irritate you. But, um, but that, that same spirit is also what keeps people from and isolating themselves from the body of Christ. Yep. Okay, so we're going to be tying it up here pretty second. Oh, yeah, 759. Let's see, Aaron, I may have to tackle this next week. It says, how do you balance enjoying non-church things that we like doing and being a man or woman of God, having a strong relationship with the Lord without making it religious. 
That is a great that question. Good question. I love it because I think that a lot of Christians get that out of balance, get it out of whack. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're either way heavy on one side and say, don't judge me, or they're way on the other side and they're, they're uptight. And, and, and usually um, judging people. And, and, and instead of religious, I, 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 I prefer the word legalistic in my mind because mm -hmm. religious is just have to have to do with the belief systems. But I get what you're saying. They're legalistic mm -hmm. about it. And they just, you know, if you, if you aren't living this pure of a life, then you're just, you're just you, you don't know God. So that's a great question. I think that we're going to try and tackle that next week. Is what we're going to do. Um, so we're going to go ahead and tie that up, tie this up tonight. Um, if you have tuned in, I, again, I really want to encourage you to share this video. Um, get it out there. And um, if you are watching this video and you have some additional questions, I want to encourage you to either A, send a message to the Church Alive Facebook and we will make sure that we address it. We don't always have the ability to go back to this video. If you're watching this video after the fact, we don't always have the ability to go back to it and, re and catch any questions we may have missed. Now, I've got this one with Aaron, so I'm going to go ahead and, and deal with it this next week for sure. Um, but if you ask a question after this live video, we may not get to it. Um, so, but I would encourage you to, sh to share this and to tune in next week. Listen, I want you to know that if you're if you are tuning in into this and maybe you don't know the Lord, um, it is not coincidental that you are you are watching this video. Uh, I want you to know that it says that God has given us. He desired that we have a life and not just life, but life more abundant. You see, knowing Jesus. And having him in my heart is more than just fire protection. It's more than just making a, a get out of hell free card. It's more than just making sure that I don't I don't pay uh, for for the sins that in the uh, that I have earned. It's also about having a genuine relationship with him, knowing knowing him, spending time with him, and and you know the Creator of heaven and earth. <coughs> they they just came out with a picture of a black hole. They never thought they'd be able to do that. Mm -hmm. They designed uh, satellites and, and, and uh, telescopes from multiple places throughout the world, gathered all this data, <coughs> and they said that it's the cumulative uh, ability of, in essence, having a telescope the size of the Earth. And they gathered all this so to figure out what a black hole looked like, and it confirms a lot of what, what, what Einstein said. And you look at that, and it should go... That's incredible. God is huge. To be able to make something so expansive, so massive, and to realize it's nothing but a drop in the bucket for God. And yet, that same God said that I made you in my image, that I breathe life into you, and I want to spend time with you. And I want you to know that if, if you are not living for God, if you recognize that you need a Savior, and you need Him in your life, um, then I want to be able to pray with you. And I want to believe with you. And so... I specifically, what I want to do is this, instead of just praying through the camera tonight and, sing, and, and, and making it kind of disconnected, I would like you to message me on, on the Church Alive, and I would like to be able to talk with you, and I want to be able to share what Jesus has done in my life, what he still does in my life, what he does in our marriage, what he does in our kids. I want to share what it's like to truly live with him. So we love you. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. We love doing this. Pastor Chad. We, you are missed, but I will tell you, uh, she's prettier than you, and I enjoyed doing this tonight. And so uh, share this again, and I hope that I hope that this ministry tonight, we love you guys, and uh, we will see you again next week. All right? Be blessed.